so yes, my name is Geraldine. I'm based in Berlin, Germany, at a company called New Thinking Communications, and I have a background working in media and technological development in Africa, and I'd like to share a little bit of information and experience on that with you today. In general, when speaking about these topics, innovation, media, technology, Africa is often left out of the discussion. However, today we're going to change that and turn our focus onto the region, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, so countries below the Saharan Africa, and ask the question what we can learn from current developments taking place there. Now, the topic of a track in general, who's next? Who's next in terms of future media consumers and developers? And if you'd ask this young man on this picture behind me in Ghana, Accra, he would say it's most definitely him. So today, one billion people live in Africa, and we sometimes tend to look at the continent and speak about it as if it was just one, one lump, one general entity, and of course that's not true. South Sudan is the latest of 54 countries in total to gain independence and international recognition. And the continent is as diverse in culture, language, resources, and stages of economic development as one could imagine. Of course, many countries in Africa are still suffering from stark differences in terms of access to education, health and finance services, and stark differences in terms of income and living situation, and also access to technology and the so-called digital divide. Now, 15 years ago, I don't think many people would have guessed that of all technologies, it would be the simple mobile phone which would have such an unprecedented impact on the continent's development. The growth in mobile telephony in Africa has surpassed the most optimistic predictions. In 2002, there were merely 49 million phones across the continent, and now there are over 500 million. This spread has made a huge impact as mobile phones cover areas other, under, otherwise completely non-covered. And it's important also, I think, to say that there are only an estimated 7 million smartphone users. A very, very small minute minority of people using mobile phones have smartphones. And unlike Europe, brand leaders there are Nokia and Blackberry. Smartphone manufacturers are slowly starting to tap into this market. And Google launched very recently the IDS Android smartphone in Kenya, priced at under $100. So it will be interesting to see how that market is going to change in the near future. It is, however, the low-cost 2G internet-capable phones that make up about half of all the handsets across the continent. Now, Nokia is by far king of the handsets and has about a 70 to 80% market share, followed by Samsung, Sony Ericsson, and LG. It's very important to see that it is these simple phones that are allowing the masses of African people to access the internet straight from their phones. Opera is the farthest uh, used um, phone browser, and their very recent statistics say that now, over 115 million people access the internet via their phone only using Opera mini browsers. This number has increased by over 100% since June 2010, so just within one year. And just to give you one country example, um, speaker Barry, who will join me on stage in a few moments, comes from South Africa. South Africa is one of the countries of the world where uh, already a few years back more people were accessing the internet through their phone than over the computers. And today statistics say that 39% of all urban based South Africans and 27% of all rural based South Africans are browsing the internet with their mobile phones. And these are really important developments on a whole as Africa still has much catching up to do when it comes to internet connection. As you can see, um, merely just over 10% of the whole population is connected to the internet via computers. And this is leaving Africa far behind the world averages. I think the world global average is about 30% of people connected to the net, and the developing country average 21%. So you can see Africa is far behind even that. Now, until a few years ago, it's not surprising that this was the case because until a few years ago, Africa was completely unconnected in many areas, especially Eastern Africa, to international submarine cables. 
um, large parts of the continent only really recently gained access to international backbone infrastructure with the connection of new submarine cables. And this has made huge changes. Um, I have a friend, for instance, living in Uganda, and a few years ago when we were comparing what I pay and what he pays for his internet connection, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you can all compare this with what you pay for your home broadband connections as well, maybe 20, maybe 30 euro a month. He was paying $600 for a satellite-based connection to have any decent and, um, and not even really stable internet connection going. So you can see how um, new infrastructural connections and these being um, then connected to the countries along the coastlines, uh, bringing wholesale pr prices down, is, is going to really impact on the continent and, and we're just starting to see the beginnings of that now. So what I think though is my strongest point I'd like to make is that Africa is not just a new market. This is not about um, European and US based telecom op operators finally realizing that there's a lot of money to be made out there and investing in these new markets. What's exciting about it for me is that Africa is creating islands of innovation and really local solutions for local problems, new applications and new business models. So in many countries across the continent, especially of course in capital cities such as Nairobi and Accra for instance, we're really starting to see such hubs of innovation appear. Unfortunately, one of the speakers um, couldn't join us today, Jessica. She's actually manager of one of the physical spaces um, called an innovation hub in Nairobi. Basically one of these spaces, this could exist in, I'm sure in Malmo and Berlin, just the same. A, a, a space for breeding innovation, an incubator, but also for co-working, bringing together entrepreneurs, techie people, creative people, and giving them the opportunity to come up with their own ideas and business models. Um, if you'd like to know more about all these topics, please approach me later. I'd like to share a few links with you also if you're interested, because there are really cool websites out there where you can see this for yourself. For instance, the site AfriGadget, which shows what people do with very few resources, but fantastic creativity to create really, um, really everyday helpers, lifesavers with the technology that's out there and being used already. I'd like to give you just a few brief examples. I said that mobile phones have made a huge impact on the continent and I would just like to explain how um, by going across some of the different sectors uh, you see some of the logos of the better known projects or brands up there for me. Ushahidi was mentioned this morning in the keynote and is probably the well, most well known of the developments, innovations that have come out of Africa and really have spread across the world. But impacts are really to be seen in all kinds of different sectors. Um, let's first have a look perhaps at the political side of things. One really interesting development um, that I've been following for a few years is the use of mobile phones for election monitoring. And this was first, um, the first case of this that I found was in Nigeria in 2007, where a local NGO used frontline SMS technology. And please ask questions later or come up to me if you'd like more details about these systems um, that I'm speaking about. They used a very simple technology basically to enable citizens to become reporters from their local polling stations and to really crowdsource the whole process of election monitoring. It was a huge success in uh, 2007 already with over 10,000 SMS being sent back and uh, being aggregated and being reviewed to see what irregularities there were happening across the country and where things were going well and where things weren't going well. And and later this was matched with observations of international election monitors and found that this was a really, really helpful instrument and, and they came to many of the same results. So you can see this is something really simple to be done but to actually motivate participa participation from the people and to promote transparency in a country where it's desperately needed like Nigeria. Mobile phones are also being used in social services, for instance, education and health, and have become really practical, valuable tools there. Um, you must see that there are huge, um, like I said, divides between the access of service that people might have in an urban area or in a rural area, and often healthcare in rural areas is um, on the shoulders of 
of health workers um, that travel to find and visit remote patients and are not really connected to clinics or hospitals the way the way we would expect it here. So for them a mobile phone can be a really very powerful tool to transmit information back to the clinics or also receive information to perhaps take a photo and send it back for a diagnosis they won't be able wouldn't be able to do by themselves or for patients also to um, get sent reminders to take medication or transmit information back. And an easy to use and already quite widespread system is called Medic Mobile. This is also based on frontline SMS, but a number of other open source platforms such as OpenMRS and is today serving more than 4.5 million people in 11 countries, including Mali and Malawi. So this is actually making a really big difference to people's everyday lives, just as mobile phones are doing for economic development. And there are a number of really good examples out there. The service Uza Mazao is just one of them, where entrepreneurs or farmers, small farmers, or our producers in rural areas can get information via SMS where the best market prices are to be gotten for their produce, um, can also advertise via SMS, and it's basically just a knowledge sharing service for rural farmers and local producers. And my next speaker is going to be talking about how mobile phones are impacting on the financial set of services. So I'm just going to introduce this very, very briefly. But maybe some of you have heard of the service M-Pesa already. This is truly an African innovation that is only starting to really be used in the Euro European contexts as well. Um, so in many countries in Africa, and this was the case, or is the case in Kenya as well, where M-Pesa was first created, people do not really have access to formal financial institutions and banking systems. People don't have accounts. There is no way to actually transmit money without physically doing it. And M-Pesa um, was a product created to enable mobile transactions, so people sending each other electronic money via their mobile phones. And this has been a really a huge success story. It's captured a huge market share. And I read up that today almost 11% of Kenyan GDP goes through the M-Pesa service. More cash goes through M-Pesa than all can Kenyan banks put together. So you can see the tremendous impact this has had. And the system is really simple to use. You can basically transfer money onto, um, from phone to phone, and there are little outlets, the way you would go and buy credit somewhere, that act as um, like M-Pesa kiosks, where you can then actually exchange this electronic money for, for cash if you'd wish to do so. So these are just a few very brief examples to show you all the different ways that mobile phones are being used today and already impacting. And like I said, many creative ones out there, which I think we can learn a lot from. So I originally invited two people to come and speak with us today. And as I said, Jessica unfortunately couldn't make it, basically due to visa issues, which is sad but true, as it goes to show that in the globalized world, with all the digital connections we have, very physical and true borders still exist that are very hard to surpass. But I'm very, very glad to welcome Barry, who's the next speaker in this session and is the Chief Executive Officer of iVery Payment Technologies. The company was founded in 1998, so Barry has been in this industry for a significant time and has spent the last decade developing IT solutions to improve transaction banking in Africa. So he's really a pioneer in the field, very active still, and has a lot of information for us to share um, on how this actually works. And Barry and I were making a few jokes uh, the, the other last night, basically saying that we're probably the two least media people in the room here. But then before becoming a banking person, Barry had a, a former life producing music videos. So there are different, <laughs> different histories to all of us. So please uh, give an applause Thank for you. Barry and welcome to the stage. Thank you.